Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on Darking Jung Lamb by me, Liam Miller, he, him. He is a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. I'm very excited. I've got a wonderful guest today. Uh, joining me from Sydney is Steph Fenton. Steph, welcome along. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, it's awesome. And so Steph is uh, one of the founding elders and the associate pastor of New City Church, uh, a new faith community meeting on Gadigal land in Sydney's inner city. Uh, and, and they also do a lot of excellent other work that we're going to get into and you can read about in the, in the show notes. But Steph, I guess, you know, are you also in inner Sydney and uh, where you're joining us from today? And just talk to us a little bit about yourself so that the, the good people here can get to know you. My pleasure. Um, yeah, so I am also in Sydney on Gadigal Bongal land. Um, I live with a few wonderful housemates who are actually also in the Uniting Church as well. So the Uniting Church is a, a wonderful friend. Yeah, nice little <laughs> shack is there. Um, I, I seem to be someone who juggles a lot of things and people often say, look, you're, you know, what do you do? What exactly do you do? You're kind of in all places all at once. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I started a church in a pandemic, um, which has been exciting and I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about that. Um, I also am chipping away at my Masters of Divinity through the University of Divinity, which is where we had connected. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping to graduate at the end of this year and kind of launch into full-time ministry. Um, we'll see what that looks like when I get there. Um, I'm also co-chairing uh, a beautiful community in Sydney of LGBTIQA plus people of faith or people from faith backgrounds and their allies. Uh, and we sort of work to be a community of support and care to connect people who are in this space um, and help the... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and help the, the Sydney church be more LGBTIQA plus safe and inclusive, um, which is quite a diverse and, um, yeah, it can be quite an overwhelming task. Mm. Um, and then I also, on the side of that, um, help run with my family an NDIS funded house for people with disabilities where my sister lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a kind of another aspect to my world that I'm in. So um, yeah, juggling a few things. And yeah, and an important part of that is all that I myself am a queer person. Um, so I find labels like um, gay and queer, gender queer, gender fluid, uh, helpful labels to identify myself. Um, but then, you know, people are beyond labels as well. Um, and then I also like to throw in the mix that I'm an ENFJ and an Enneagram to wing three, because I feel like they've really helped me get to know myself. <laughs> Great. Uh, it's, it's funny, the, um, in the last episode we did, which was uh, uh, like, an, like with a few different guests talking about New Year's resolutions, um, the, the Enneagram numbers got thrown out. And I, I was just trying to do that thing where you stay really quiet so no one looks at you and realizes you have this huge gap in your, like I, I hear it talked about all the time, but I've never done it. Um, but, uh, but it does seem that a lot of people do find a, a helpful language for, uh, and, and we're really into thinking about who they are and how they relate. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit interesting, I think, um, and kind of this is some of the, um, the pastoral stuff that I find quite exciting is that I think a lot of people, and particularly Christians, people of faith backgrounds, are drawn to the Enneagram because they've never ever... Um, told that they can focus on themselves hmm. and this is a, a thing that allows people to get to know themselves and connect and sort of integrate themselves a bit better as a full human being like hmm. I integrate my spirituality with my emotional and physical desires um, and fears and I think that's something that uh, definitely we're trying to do as a church at New City is help people um, sort of rediscover themselves when they're told you know you just need to self-sacrifice everything, deny yourself um, to kind of come into a space and say, no, like we're about full, whole well-being. Um, and I think the Enneagram is kind of a gateway into that. And it's like, you know, gets the Christian tick of approval. So, hey, um, yeah. 
gateway personality <laughs> tests. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that might be, a, I, I, maybe I, I want to follow that through through because you say you, you, you connected it to the work you're trying to do in New City. Um, because sometimes, you know, you'll see their accusations leveled against people often from minoritized or marginalized identity groups, be it, be it racialized or sexually or gender diverse or others where um, the critique comes of, oh, you're putting another identity um, first, right? Or another identity as a defining thing rather than your identity in Christ, which should be one's only defining identity. Um, you know, when, when the way where we met was me talking about James Cone in a class you did. And it's a, it's a, it's a you know, critique leveled against him. A critique makes it sound like it's got any validity. A, um, whatever, accusation leveled against him that, you know, his, his claim that I was black before I was Christian, you know, it, or, or these kind of things. And so it's often this, you know, accusation leveled that, you know, well, no, you should just be Christian. And, I, and so for any, and then when you take it more macro, being a church that is trying to identify um, or trying to set up a, a culture in which we are saying that people from particular identities particular communities um, are welcomed and affirmed and celebrated and we want to actually show work together how we live into that more fully. Um, again, I can see there being this kind of accusation floating around that, well, that's putting something else alongside what should be our true identity, you know, in a kind of Ephesians way of, of, of being in Christ. Um, so, Look, I'm not trying to give a lot of credence to that accusation, but it's also one that comes out a lot. And so I'm just curious about your thoughts on how you and the team at New City are kind of thinking about it and about how you, you know, organize yourselves with this kind of, oops, with this kind of in, in, the, in the mix. Yeah, totally. Um, it's interesting. I have blogged about this exact idea. Um, so I also have a, a blog called queervangelical.com. Um, those being my two very formative identities. Um, a couple of years ago, I came out of the, the low evangelical Anglican church and just left that actually this year after 32 years, just mm. about. Um, so that's kind of my church background. Um, but yes, often as I was processing who I am and my identity and labels and things like that, I would often be told, you know, you're putting your gayness or your sexuality above your identity in Christ. So to work through that. Um, I think that like what I've learned a little bit is that actually um, for me, the labels are just something that helps me understand who I am. Uh, and that would be for a lot of other people in this space, no matter what your um your label or identity factor is, whatever's helpful for you to be like, oh yeah, I am queer. Oh yeah, my, my cultural heritage is this. Um, and it helps me discover who I am and live more fully, um, yeah, as a mm. human. Mm. Um, and then I think that like, there's the other side of it where the labels, um, labels are used in a very negative way where so for me, um, it was when I identify as gay, I just want to stop there. Like, I just want to stop and say, yeah, I'm gay and also Christian and also whatever. But then when I say I'm gay, the church then tells me I am deviant or evil or leading people away from Christ. And it's actually not, I think for me, it's like, well, it's not anything that hinders it. It's actually what you kind of lump on top of the label that makes it unhelpful. It's not unhelpful in and of itself to identify in this way, to say yeah, I'm a queer Christian. Um, but actually then the labels and the association that comes with being a queer Christian that I think is the unhelpful bit. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm sure, and I think having conversations with particularly like Aboriginal Christians, uh, for them, this is something that uh, there's a lot of crossover there. And for a lot of other people, I'm sure they identify in the same way of like, you know, I'm not trying to put, I'm just trying to live out my life as a Christian and, and you know, integrate myself as a human being and what does that mean as I follow Christ? Um, but you're actually putting something, you're putting the barrier there. I'm not doing that. Uh, and I think that's a really helpful distinction to make. Um, but then also, um, yeah, kind of coming back to how, how we do that at, New City Church as well. So um, I'm one of three pastors at the church and we're sort of trying to 
um, do a bit of a team pastoring thing because a lot of people have been part of hierarchical leadership structures. Uh, and that's the, you know, dominant of a lot of um, uh, denominations. And, you know, that might be something that can work out really well. Um, but for a lot of our community has unfortunately ended in uh, control and fear and harm uh, where they've been excluded with really detrimental effects. Um, so we're trying to move away from that. So our pastoral team is having conversations and, you know, very first and foremost, one of the first things that we said when we started this was um, we don't want to be a queer church. Uh, so we all identify as queer. We don't ever want to get to that space where it's like, you know, this is who we are. You know, we want to be, and our values are, we want to be a Jesus church. We want to be a justice church. We want to be a community church. And then we have a whole bunch of other things where we want to be safe and inclusive. We want to be generously hospitable. We want to be um, people who disciple one another and mentor one another. We want to be a church that grows and looks outward. Um, and so the people that are finding us and the people that need that space, first and foremost, are people who identify as queer because they have nowhere else to go. They've kind of gone the last straw and then here we are. And that's mm. my story. Is that mm. I started this church for myself as, as much as I started it for other people. Um, and, and Joel, Polya and Karen Pack, who are the other, other pastors, would say the same thing. It's like we kind of had nowhere else to go. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know. That's kind of, a, that's a long-winded answer, but it kind of touches on some of those points. Um, oh, that's a great, great answer. And I think... Um, there were two things that I kind of thought about with the first part, we are talking about that identity thing. One of the things that is, is kind of in a helpful way is, you know, with groups who have, you know, so identity is often something that you're made aware of when you are not in the majority, right? You know, when you're, when you're somewhat, it's, it's often an othering thing to, to put an, uh, this identity. And then there's often, a, a, uh, you know, as you say, this process of reclaiming and understanding and living into, um, and the thing is then you at least are engaging in this process of wondering, okay, how do these various identities, one of which is Christian, fit together, clash, wrestle, expand each other, you know, all this, it becomes this process and dialogue where you realize, oh, they're not like, you know, diachronic, um, you know, opposed or, or, or absolutely separate. They can, they can intermingle. And the thing is, it's an actually an active and explicit process. Whereas I think for, you know, white folk, white men, white, able-bodied cis-het men like myself is you don't get told you have an identity. You, you get to assume you're the normative, which means then when you're Christian, there's this implicit thing that goes on that, well, actually my identity, those, what it means to be Christian is also to be cis-het normative, white male, etc. You know, it's this thing of, a, you, you start to implicitly link those together because you've never actually thought about you having multiple identities that are somehow wrestling. And so I don't let the Christian thing um, question and judge and interrogate the race or gender thing in, 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 a, in a helpful and constructive way, in a way that hopefully frees them up. And so you see so much of this conflating of Western particular ideas of masculinity and what it means to be a good godly man or whatever it is. You know, you see that because you're not actually thinking about these identities as live, not fixed, ongoing projects of, of you know, that are, that, are, that are lived into and performed and et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, there's such a, such a value in, a, in actually thinking it, you know, in, in actually realising that you have more than one identity and, and that it's not fixed and it actually needs to, in, that they need to be in relation and interrogated. That was, yeah. So I think that, that was a helpful thing that I sparked in my mind from your reflections. Yeah, yeah. And I think you have people who, um, you know, I had people who said to me, you know, you're making a big deal out of your sexuality or like you're putting too much emphasis on it. Um, but actually, uh, it, I, I wasn't the first one to do that. Like, I'm not the one doing that. Uh, mm. that's, that's a sociological community church thing mm. that's happening where um, I'm just discovering who I am yeah. and then wanting to continue to do the same thing. I'm just, nothing's changed for me. I just realised something new about myself. Mm. Um, and I'm not the one making it big deal about it it's actually coming from the community um yeah so. yeah it also makes me think and I, I wish I could remember who tweeted it because I'm going to steal it outright but it was basically like you know the the idea being leveled against you that you know 
you're making a big deal of your sexuality. And it's like, well, I'm not the one I'm spending $20,000 on a wedding. Someone I met last semester at Christian college. Cause I want to get <laughs> married and have sex. Um, you know, like that's making a big deal out of your sexuality. Um, <laughs> and we just don't see it. Um, so, so let's talk a bit about new city. Um, cause one of the things I was so excited about seeing this and seeing what, what, what you all are doing is, I think, you know, we often maybe look at like somewhere like the US or a little bit like the UK and you think about the number of various churches and church traditions where it's safe for someone who is sexually and gender diverse as part of the LGBTIQA plus community to go to, right? And, and there's, you know, from mainline to very high church Anglican to lower church Pentecostal, there's just the options are there. And I think, you know, in some ways that's not what's often been afforded um, in Australia, you know, often the churches who have been maybe more first, I mean, it, it's varied. I'm not trying to simplify this, but it's like often the ones who've been more ready and, you know, in some sense, some parts of the United Church, I'm not trying to give us this shining gold star, but some parts have, but usually fairly high liturgy, um, fairly particular kind of style and theology, um, you know, and, and the like. And, you know, so you all are kind of, taking a very different approach. You're a very different kind of church from a different kind of tradition with different values and, 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 and style and form. And I think that's what's exciting in the sense of you just want to see it. You love to see it, as they would say. Um, that these various forms of churches and styles from, from Pentecostal to high church to liberal to uh, more orthodox or whatever you want to, whatever you know, labels we want to start using can all be, you know, more and more of these types of churches being safe. So talk to us a little about where you're coming from I guess, you know, the gap somewhat you're feeling, as you say, you started this church for you. What was the gap? What wasn't there for you before this? And, uh, and you yeah, talk a bit about the, the church into that space. Yeah, sure. And also thanks for being so excited about us. It's lovely when people catch hold of our vision and, and what we're doing and they're like, yeah, we're excited for you. Oh, you're um, welcome. <laughs> I, I always talk, we're meant, I mean, not, you know, we're not meant to be in competition, you know, and, and also I'm far enough away that I'm not worried you're going to take anyone from the church. Sure, <laughs> look out, look out. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, totally. I think my, my story and my journey is very similar to a lot of the other people who have found us in that I was part of uh, a lower, more relaxed, um, evangelical tradition. Um, so that tradition, uh, you know, week to week is not high liturgy, is often, you know, does creative deconstructed church a little bit, um, can be quite free and easy rather than a, a structured liturgical emphasis on liturgy, as you say. Um, also a strong emphasis on the centrality of scripture. Um, and the Bible, um, and, you know, those are things that we're sort of good conversations that are coming out at the moment is what is the, the role of scripture. Authority is a very hard word and very weighted word, um, and I think in a way we're trying to find new language and new words for almost everything um, that's been part of the Christian faith that we've sort of grown up with, mm. um, just because it comes with so much baggage. But yeah, so I, I found myself after, um, yeah, a very, very hard um, exclusion in an Anglican church that I was part of in Sydney's inner west, where uh, I had gone there knowing, you know, quite confident in who I was as a, as a gay person um, and then unexpectedly meeting someone in that community and uh, us forming a relationship. Um, and when I told the minister that that had happened, um, then we had a follow-up meeting, which was to discuss, you know, the intricacies of our sexual life. Uh, and, you know, because if you're performing a sex act, um, that's, you know, we need to know and that will determine what the outcome of the situation is. And that's a very, very uncomfortable invasive conversation that a lot of gay people uh, and, and trans people uh, are having in similar churches. Um, and I didn't realise at the time how violating that sort of conversation was because I was so culturally used to it. 
Mm. Um, but then that meeting then led on, led on to um, one where we were told that we would no longer be able to take part in communion, so the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, uh, in order to show that we were out of communion with the rest of the church because of our relationship. Um, and it was at that point that I thought, well, if I'm no longer part of the body, and no longer recognised as a family member and no longer able to contribute in any way or like, I'm actually not practising my faith anymore at this church mm. because what I feel and what I know to be a Christian or to be a follower of Jesus is to be part of a family and a community that together grows and builds God's kingdom. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was then that I sought out an inclusive higher Anglican church, um, which was so beautiful. And I've talked about them um, really loving me back to well-being and healing. And I describe those few years as just like breathing out the tension that I didn't even know I had um, of like just ready to defend myself and being in this mode of fear and you know, and then just being able to breathe that out and being loved for who I was and, you know, people not seeing first and foremost my queer identity, but just seeing actually like you have a, a great passion and love for Jesus, you want to serve the church, you're a great leader. Uh, and I, that's the first time those words had ever been said to me, yeah. um, which is wild. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and so I was really missing the creative low uh, church and there were conversations kind of bubbling with others who were in the same position. And uh, so Karen was an ordained Assemblies of God minister mm -hmm. um, and experienced a similar moment of exclusion, um, you know, and people kind of have their own stories, but they're very similar. Yeah. Um, Joel was a, a minister in the Anglican Church for a couple of years. We have a couple of people who are who are studying Masters of Divinity who are at seminary or at, at theological college at the moment who um, are just so passionate about ministry in the church, but with no no place to go. And and I guess you do mention the Uniting Church, and the Uniting Church was a safe haven for me in the first six months after that really painful moment of exclusion before I found this Anglican church. Mm. Um, but the, again, a lot of the, yeah, the uh, churches that are inclusive have that, have that liturgy. They have like, it was songs I didn't know. Uh, it was very, very unfamiliar. Uh, and so things, conversations that we've had about New City Church are about creating a community and a service that, feels the same mm. so that when you are losing your community and losing everything that you've known and trying to piece together, you know, what do I believe anymore? Who's on my side? Who do I have in my corner? There's something that looks and feels mm. similar. Yeah. Uh, and you have people who get your journey. Um, <laughs> and that's the space that you find when you're coming out and you need somewhere to land. Yeah. I, yeah. I, just to say something there, I think, which is so important is, and I think, you know, I want to say this for a lot of my, you know, United Church folks and others who, who hear this is that often is because of our own upbringing and some of our own baggage, sometimes there's this kind of assumption, no one could possibly be a feminist and an evangelical, right? Or, um, or anything like that, right? And we have often that kind of a snide derision um, you know, which is usually more classist than anything else against like kind of evangelical Pentecostalism and things like that. Um, you know, without ever looking at the, the, the log in our own eyes. Um, but, you know, but the thing is, you know, you know, but sometimes we think like, well, why, why don't all the people who believe in our, agree with some of our more politic side of things come to us? And it's like, well, because style and aesthetic and, and, and that thing that makes your heart go with the beat of a drum, you know, means something to people and people loved so much of their tradition and would still be there were it not for this. And it's not just this kind of necessary thing, very easy to transfer. And as you say, people aren't just that, that one identity and you know and, and so those other things play a part in all of that and you know i experienced that a lot when i worked at um with the university uh, in the university chaplaincy and we were the kind of only religious or christian um chaplaincy which was affirming and and open and so we would get people come to us but a lot of people wouldn't necessarily feel home in the style or in the 
broader theology and things like that. And, 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 you know, you also realize, you know, people shouldn't have to stop being <laughs> the, the tradition they are, you know, you know, the people have often been drawn there for a reason. Um, and yes, that's why I think it's so great that, you know, be able to find this place that will still feel, you know, familiar and as home and um, still have those things that, that fostered their relationship with Jesus that they're wanting to live out um, just now, hopefully without exactly, as you say, all that trauma and stress and, and um, denigration of their humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, I think, yeah, the, um, the United Church is obviously like our greatest ally in, in Sydney, particularly being so um, conservative, you know, I've kind of hazarded a guess that 80%, 75% don't believe that women should be equal in leadership. Mm. You know, that's that's quite conservative when you think about the, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, maybe half the Baptist and Uniting Church. You know, I'm, I'm not particularly sure, but you have two, two of the biggest denominations and then the other ones, then you've got Pentecostal. Um, you know, it's a significant majority that, you know, can't even have women equal. Mm. And then so for uh, LGBTIQA plus people, the, the situation's even worse for their inclusion in their space. So so the Uniting Church and the ones who are inclusive, amazing. Like, um, I think that, I think one of the things that I've found engaging with the Uniting Church is, um, and this is a really important, uh, really important topic for discussion, I think, for this age is, um, the uh, evangelism and the place of evangelism. I think the Uniting Church, and I'm not sure maybe you can shed some light, but I think that's something that is really drilled into me as an evangelical Christian, is that this is something to be shared and grown. And um, and I think the, the Uniting Church does that from a social justice perspective. And the evangelical church does that from a uh, more of a theology perspective, I think, or like more of a scriptural perspective, teaching. Yeah, apologetics. Um, yes, yes, apologetics, yes. Um, yeah, and I think we, we're kind of in this space where we're like, we want to do those two things together. Yep. Um, and, and I think it's quite unique. Um, I, maybe. I don't want to claim <laughs> something, but... And, I'm sure you'll. I'm sure you'd find allies who 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 think similar and are. But you're right. I still think it's it's not necessarily the common right. Like I think you know yeah you are capturing a lot of that. That is a divide that I think does exist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I don't want to paint anyone in a you know. But I think that's something that we when we started this we were like this is this is a gap mm. that we see yep. in our space in Sydney, an inclusive church that wants to hold. Um, social justice and justice together with Bible teaching and apologetics and, you know, the theological stuff and doing those things together and also being a church that wants to grow and, and send that out, you know, not just kind of, we, we really want to be a safe place and protective and have boundaries around that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hope I'm, I don't want to be treading on toes or anything. I think I just haven't found it. Um, no, I think, I think there's definitely... That's, you know, as you say, it's, it's certainly, you know, there's always going to be differences within all these communities, but you're right. Like a lot of that is probably like such an, especially probably in Sydney where it is, you know, there's such a strong identity of more conservative churches that, that often those on the outside are, are so averse to being any way near looking like the, uh, you know, the, the more common public image that you go so far the other way that you forget that, you know, evangelism is sharing good news. And if you're a church that is affirming and welcoming and engaged in the pursuit of justice for all, you have good news to share, uh, mm. you know? And I think sometimes the work for some of the uniting churches or, or other churches, you know, just speaking from this from my own perspective, is sometimes just helping people realize that there is actually a link between you care about refugees and, and that can be, you know, deeply formed through the stories of scripture and the symbols of the faith, you know, beyond just maybe a, a simple catch cry of Jesus being a refugee, like something, or your, you know, your care about, you know, you know, a lot of these things don't come because you ignore scripture, can come because you've deeply engaged and walked with it. Um, and I think that's, that's a helpful move. And I see it, you know, and definitely there are churches who are, you know, in churches that I know of that are doing it. But I think, yeah, sometimes there's such a fear of we can't be seen as, 
something else. And so we're going to be reticent to, to ever possibly, um, you know, be, you know, like I, I maybe I'll sort of maybe mention I'm a Christian at some point, but if I'm really sure, I'd, so, yeah, but like, I won't do it too much. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that's what I've loved so much about studying at the university, university yeah. of divinity and, um, you know, engaging some of, I, I think it's, I think it's a bit of a fresh, a fresh feel of the, the Christian movement in the places that I'm sort of engaging with. I'm like, ah, oh, I really, I, I love that. And I want to grow that and I want to build that. Um, yeah. Where I can, mm. I think it's, it's going to be, you know, I, I'm prayerful for it and I'm excited to be part of the ministry that hopefully, um, you know, is we kind of joke a little bit about being, you know, when you're queer and you're so far excluded, then when you walk back towards the centre, you get to catch everyone on the way <laughs> um, and, and you just got nothing to lose because yeah. you're so far out that you can't get any further out that the only way to go is just in and take everyone else along with you. Totally. Um, so... That's wonderful. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I was thinking about, you know, there's so many people who are in churches who don't often don't realize what their theologies are around um, you know, female leadership or um, inclusion of LGBTIQIA plus folk. Um, and, but they're there because of either they, they resonate with the style or they found a community that loves them. And then sometimes maybe you do discover what it is. You do, pick it out and then you but then you have this real wrestle of well do I leave this style or these people who I love or do I stay and either try to change it or just tune it out or, or whatever and, and my hope is you're going to have the flip here that a bunch of people are going to come be like wow this place is just so loving and they're involved in things and the music's great and then only lady do you realize you know like actually we're in the circum <laughs> uh, oh well, cool I'm here now I love them and then people get changed that way rather than pulled the other way you know <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. So, um, um, let me expand it out and talk a bit about equal voices. Um, so, as you said, this is a, a, a much broader body working across the churches of various stripes um, about creating safer spaces and more understanding and dialogue. So, talk a little about, I guess, how you kind of connected in and, and a bit about, you know, what are some of the things that, that you all are working toward at the moment? Yeah, and again, I think I want to start with the fact that I think Sydney is a very unique space mm. for this movement in that it is more conservative, I think, that the, the church landscape, and I think the political landscape potentially as well, is a bit more, um, you know, and conservative is, is quite a baggage word. I don't want to use it in a, in a negative way. Um, or try to find labels that are helpful and speak honestly to people's beliefs and experiences. But I think it's a label that I think is helpful. Mm. Um, but I think it's just, there are, there are so few spaces that you can find as a queer Christian. And, you, you know, this is me at this point in time, go back 10 years mm. for people who are coming out and trying to keep their faith. 10 years ago and over the last 10 years, you know, what's shifted in that amount of time um, is that it's just such a small space. And it's kind of funny because I think everyone's experience is that they, they thought they were the only person walking their journey for years. And then they connect with someone who's part of this queer Christian underground community <laughs> movement. Uh, and they're like, there's a whole world out here. Yeah. Like, where, where y'all been? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe it's a sign of the times that, you know, finally we can kind of pop up and put our heads out and, mm. you know, Equal Voices is this, is, is a national movement um, of people who are now vocally and visible. And I think the, the uh, marriage plebiscite sort of forced people to be, to be vocal and, and speak out. Um, so I think it's kind of a unique time and space, I guess, um, in that I think it's time for a movement to be more vocal, you know, mm. and often the, I read an article particularly about the Church of England and the Anglican Church more broadly about often the liberals will uh, want to keep, I, keep unity 
but it's but it's actually false unity. Yeah. Um, and so I think people who are more on the progressive end are now seeing that unity is inverted commas unity. It's actually not a unity that, you know, they're seeing the harm, the stories are coming out. Um, and so, yeah, so Equal Voices is um, a, a beautiful group of people trying to be more vocal and visible. Um, we've had a lot of people share their stories uh, in organisations uh, and, and schools as teachers um, kind of for the, for the political discussion around religious discrimination at the moment. And so it's been a privilege to support people to share their stories uh, in that space and actually contribute to a conversation that's really, really important around religious freedom and religious discrimination at the mm. moment. And I guess the, the power and privilege and space that the church has held traditionally in Australia in the secular space uh, and, and what's the cost of that been? And I was really excited to see friends in Melbourne um, get the, the bill up to, to ban conversion therapy. Um, all of that is fantastic and comes at like great personal cost and to be able to journey with people and create a space where they feel supported and part of something bigger um, and not isolated and alone mm. is just amazing like i feel so privileged to be able to have have that role in people's yeah. lives mm. i think that's that's wonderful and i think like it just also helps people realize i mean because the media does no favors and that if it wants to get um two dissenting opinions on like you know on on a topic around you know usually you know let's say you know sexual uh you know the conversion um therapy bill for instance or or you know, an abortion um, question or a question around marriage equality when that was in the new, you know, like the bigger thing that, you know, it's all right, we're going to get, you're never going to get the, on the pro side, the person up on Q and A is that, or very rarely is the Christian in favor, right? Of, of the more that it, it's always like, okay, we're going to get up the conservative Christian to fight against the secular progressive, right? Because that's, that's the fight people are going to pay their money to see. And that's what we're going to do. And so that becomes the image. And this is not, no, that's a lot of, that, that's a representative group. But it's saying, you know, that, you know, what you want to see more of is, oh, no, there's huge amounts of Christians, both in leadership and I'm sure many, many, many in the pews who, uh, you know, uh, have the wide range of, of approaches and, and on politics on these things and getting those voices. Because as you say, sometimes it's just about that recognition that there's another, wait, there can be a gay Christian? <laughs> like, like that's, that's a thing that you're allowed to be uh, yeah. and happily, um, you know, like, you know, <laughs> And in love and loved, you know, like it, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's this holy, liberative, abounding in grace thing, that moment of recognition. And so getting those in public spaces where you're like, oh, wow, Christians have more than the one viewpoint on this. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe that just lodges in your head when you're 14 and just stays there until it's, you know, you know it doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't really lead you to something until you're much older, but it's there, you know, I think it's just so such important work. So it's, it's, you know, it's wonderful to hear that happening and, you know, hopefully more and more uh, are driven by actually, you know, seeking out those different voices and not just the money prize money fight. Yeah, that's right. And I often, I often talk about embodying division, like embodying mm. a divisive debate. Like if you, yeah. if you're on either side of this, um, feeling like this can't be reconciled or put together or both have space, where, where Christians are protected and queer people are protected and feel free to be themselves, um, come and talk to me because yeah. I, I, I embody that. I live yeah. that. Um, and I'm on both sides and I want the best for everyone here um, mm. because I live it. Uh, and so, yeah, I think we're, we're a pretty special, unique community to be able to speak, to speak at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we're a real gift, uh, uh, I and I might so. be a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's beautiful. That's I think that's entirely true, and I think you know because yeah, we do like to set up these dichotomies again. When I, I was at the university when the plebiscite was being held, and we were going to meetings with the university body with all the chaplains, where it was like essentially the meeting was set up to be like a bunch of the other chapters want to complain that their meetings about no are getting harassed or, or that their signs are getting pulled down. And I'm like, they're like, Oh, actually, um, our signs that was Christians for yes also got, also got uh, vandalized. So um, like, you know, you know, just like trying to, you know, like, 
wait, just hold up. Um, <laughs> we don't necessarily need that provision. Like, um, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, just try to, you know, because it comes so quickly. Like, well, this is that block that needs to be, have that moment. Yeah, and I think that kind of leads into, if I can catch that moment to yeah. talk about something, is um, leads into some of the, the passions that we have for New City as well, is mm. that um, in, in, in an increasingly divided, particularly online world, um, politically and faith-wise, um, we, we really want to be a space that works through how do you hold difference in community mm. and how do you, how do you, I was actually in a conversation last night about how do you hold to keeping people safe and holding to conviction and, um, you know, being honest about what is harmful and has been abusive and protecting mm. people and safeguarding people. Um, while also always being open to the other. Yeah. And for me, I, I genuinely, my prayer is that uh, the church that I've been part of, the, the Sydney Anglican Diocese, known for its fundamentalism and its real sheer lockdown on uh, any inclusivity of queer people who are acting on their queerness. And I kind of want to put that in inverted commas because that's a phrase that I'll tell you. Um, is that I would, I just want to have relationships of mutuality um, where we dialogue openly and you learn from me and I learn from you because I know ultimately that we, we are one in Christ and if we really put that at the centre and, and became a family and became committed to our covenant to each other and sticking together through hard things um, and, and actually did that respectfully and graciously and compassionately while also seeking reconciliation, I think, in a way that needs to happen, where um, when we talk about justice, you know, there have been wrongs mm. um, and there are more vulnerable people in the community and less vulnerable people and acknowledging those dynamics too. I don't want to just go over those, but I really think there's a call to the church now to be a place where we bring people together across difference and emphasise um emphasize good behavior and love <laughs> that is yeah. um and it's a big task and there's a lot of complexity in that mm. and i'm painting it as an easy thing but it's so difficult um but i really do think that's something that i want to be part of and i want our church to be part of and it's hard but i want to do it mm. no that's wonderful i think you're right that, you know, at its best, the church is a place that can provide you know, an environment in which these discussions and these meetings can happen. These encounters can happen. Like I think about where I am um, in, in Tukli, which is a small beachside town with high levels of socioeconomic uh, disadvantage. Um, but it's kind of got three communities, right? It's got like the, the people with like either homeless or hidden homelessness or on pensions, like lower socioeconomic high levels of mental health and, and, and uh, substance uh, abuse issues. You've got this, you know, this whole portion. Then you've got um, kind of older retirees who've been around for quite a while. And you've got um, then also the influx of maybe folks that are coming up from Sydney or pushing on from um, Long Jetty as it gets continually gentrified and coming in. You've now got a, you know, got a bougie Pilates studio now and a hipster barber and a few other, you know, cafes with hashtags in their names you know, so you're getting a bit of that but not a, not much you've got these three groups and naturally tensions emerging around this on, on whose is Tukli um, and and should Tukli continue to go at the pace it needs to go to be a place that welcomes uh, the, the, those those who are more marginalized poorer um, you know facing the the, the, the the huge umbrella of issues that often accompanies poverty and the like um, or should it, you know, forge ahead to become, you know, increasingly um, appealing to those on its horizon, you know, and, and, and it's this fight and you see it in just the 
awful hell space of local community Facebook groups. Um, and just the, you know, which, which for my, you know, this is the cross I bear as a minister in an area is joining and monitoring these groups to see what happens and what people are saying. Um, but, you know, just, just, just the level of, of dehumanizing, denigrating talk that goes on to, about people, you know, you know, expectation or understanding of, of what battles people are fighting and, you know, how can the church provide spaces where these groups can encounter and meet, which is not easy, again, because, again, like people are looking often those groups, not always, but often people are looking for very different things in that space. So how do you provide one where everyone can, where, they, where you know, safety is held um, and space is made, but there's encounters. But I think the church, since it's not beholden to shareholders, you know, is, is one which, you know, at its best, um, is not one which um, is one that maybe has some possibility alongside some other groups possibility of creating this kind of space and an environment and and walking this kind of journey um in whatever area whatever the fault lines are in particular areas and it's going to be different where you are it's the one that's kind of most evident here it is something that the church can be doing it rather than thinking like okay well let's you know often the thing of starting new churches is you know there's often the the they often are sometimes riding coattails of gentrification themselves sometimes you know like like oh, okay cool like we'll, we'll come back to this area now and start our own hip thing um and just ignore that there was churches plugging away for the longest time feeding folks you know in these areas um mm -hmm. and that's like i'm trying to be aware of it coming into a place like this but yeah it's just it's it's you know at its best though you can still you know work and walk with the most people you possibly can mm. yeah and i think i think that's the that's the question and the the dream that I think New City has, uh, and the and it will be a real struggle for us, I think, as well, and a real challenge. And as you say, it probably is for everyone. Um, yeah, I think that I I grew up in a church that was a real motley crew, and anyone was welcome and. I'm so grateful for that because I think that's really shaped what I think church mm. should be. Um, and, and I think it's hard when you start a church. One of my, one of my thoughts is like, when are we going to become an institution that just is out to sustain itself? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the nature of institutions is that you just, you become insular and you want to just keep yourself going. Um, <laughs> Also, the, you know, the conversation around uh, land and land justice for Aboriginal peoples um, is a real strong one. And I think all of those things, uh, yeah, and, and not being, being people who are the same, uh, promoting diversity, uh, always having conversations with people who are different. Um, and I think that does just come from an attitude of, always looking outward, always having people check, you know, if your culture ever becomes too insular or too sustaining of itself. Uh, I think those are some of the conversations that we're sort of having where we're mm. like, you know, we, we need to, um, we have a very, we're people who are recovering and healing mm. and just need a safe space. But then how do we uh, engage others and always be outward while protecting um, people who need that space. Yep. Um, and I think I have more questions than answers for that. Um, <laughs> you know, and we'll discover it as we go. Yeah, totally. And I think there's an, like a, one of the things that we tried to value here is this idea of like, we'll change as we change in that, like, like I'm, I'm going to come with, you know, ideas to try to, you know, that's, you know, part of what I'm here to do. But like, if, you know, like I might have this idea of we're going to be just plucking it out of the air. We're going to be like a young families church. That's what I want to be, a young family church. And then all of a sudden you find that everyone who's coming is, you know, in their 40s and 50s, um, you know, no kids, but wanting connection and community. If I keep going, no, family church. And like, you know, and I'll persist with a particular style and times and and what it, and marketing that just, just says that uh, at the expense of everyone. Um, then like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, you know, and it's, and it's the same as like, you know, even, or even as like, you know, what, what are the, the main issues of justice that I really value? Let's say it's, um, 
like, and everything's interconnected. So I'm not trying to play one thing off another here, but let's say it's, it's topic mm -hmm. X, but then you have like nine people come to your church who are like, we're passionate and already involved in Y and a bunch of us are experts in it. We want to work with the community towards that. And I'm like, no, I really feel like the identity here is to, to focus on this topic. You know, like it's a, you know, change as we change, they can be open to evolving and, and being formed by the people you are. Cause if we are the body, then that, that should, we should be, you know, malleable. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think as you've been speaking, you've kind of hit on something that I think I I feel has been a, you know, we've got a lot of the same people in church leadership at the moment. We've got a lot of the same voices being represented in the theological academy. And we have what feels like a bit of a, a bubbling shift of uh, some of those spaces, people realising we need... Uh, people of color, color. We need people um, from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds. We need queer people. We need, you know, and the, the theological diversity is sort of growing that then informs the church. And people are seeing that leadership needs to be diverse. Um, and maybe that's just something that you know I'm kind of seeing and and tasting the first fruits of now. And I'm really excited to see that grow and change and part of being a leader in a church might be to step back and step out and let others take over um, rather than, you know, continue to go ahead. But I, but I, yeah, as you've been talking, I think that is, I think that's something that I think does need to change um, in order to shift that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important. I was trying to find a quote um, while you were talking about this, I heard recently it was um, from Samuel Ernest, um, who wrote this, he's a PhD uh, student at Yale, but he was talking about like, you know, a gay queer theologian trained by a gay queer theologians is still a relatively new possibility. So on the whole, things feel like the blossoming of something latent and unlikely. Um, and it is interesting to think that like, you know, and, and to some extent, like, you know, you can see that with a lot of the movements in theology that, you know, um, that often it's that, generation of when the first time people get taught by folks who share that identity and experience. So what comes, you know, in black liberation theology, Cone comes through and becomes, you know, the first black teacher at Union and, and in New York. And then from him, he supervises the doctorates of, of um, Dolores Williams and, 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 the, and, and Kelly Brown Douglas and a bunch of stuff, you know, who form womanist theology and stuff like that, which becomes this much, you know, a, a furthering and a deepening and expanding of the conversation that, that Cohen had started. Um, and, and, and yeah, and so what kind of Samuel's saying here is like, you know, he's kind of one of the first of this group, you know, he's, um, you know, with Lynn Tonstad there at Yale and stuff, it's like, of coming through this and, and what that will mean and make possible. And I think my hope is that, you know, Australia continues to exactly to, to diversify and, 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 and shake open and open up both the um, more formal halls of, of, of academic institutions, but beyond that, um, and that, you know, what we'll start to see as people get to actually, you know, continue to have these conversations and develop this work in conversations um, with a broader community will be, will be very exciting. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thinking of starting to maybe like land the plane a little bit, um, though I'm really having a great time. So, and you said you'd freed up the afternoon, so maybe we'll just go for three hours. Um, <laughs> it's a bad thing to say. Uh, How does that sound, listeners? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, we just dropped a zero. Well, anyway, it's been great. Um, so you started, you started a church in a pandemic, which, you know, just good stuff. Great work. Um, oh, why not, hey? Why not make it hard for yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I was up here doing something new and I was just like, the bread and butter of starting something new, uh, you host things to raise your visibility and you go to everything that's on in town. And you go early and you chat to people and you stay late and you chat to people and you just show your face. And you get, and like, well, none of that's happening. You know, just the, the... Or you go to coffee with people, right? All that over-the-plate stuff, just, just absolutely impossible to do or virtually impossible to do um but anyway you've kind of come you've, you've you're out of 2020 though we're not out of covid but i guess you're thinking i guess there are only two parts here what are some of the things you learned or that you got to interrogate about being church that came from starting it in 2020 in, in mixed covid and how potentially does that shape and inform where you're going next 
Yeah, it's a really beautiful question. Um, it's funny that you say those are the things you should do because I think we've done the opposite. We, <laughs> uh, we, we really didn't tell anyone or engage with anyone. Uh, <laughs> we kind of have kept ourselves a little bit as a low profile because um, we wanted to be really intentional about going deep and building a strong culture and DNA mm. that reflects the community that we wanted to grow into. And I think it's a bit of a unique space as well is because we have people who have been on the margins of churches for a while, potentially years, mm. quite a lot of people who have come from traumatic church backgrounds, um, some abusive church backgrounds who, um, you know, to, in order to then accommodate more people in the community and welcome them in and to live into the value of being generous and hospitable and discipling and growing, uh, actually just need time first. Mm. Uh, and so we talk about it as uh, building a, a pillow that then when other people come in, we can catch them. <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so we we haven't advertised ourselves really. We haven't. It feels so weird because we really think that we're onto something unique and beautiful that will be a real source of life for mm, people mm. on the margins of churches looking for a church like ours. And it and it's like this yearning to tell everyone, hey, we're here. You don't have to, you know, put up with that anymore or, you know, if you're really just clinging on and you're struggling and or if you've left the church but you still want to seek for God and you want a place where you can ask questions, like, we're here. Um, <laughs> so, and, and it's kind of one of the cool things that I think when we do eventually advertise, we actually think one of our things will be that to manage is, is growth too quickly. Mm. Um, because mm -hmm. since we've had conversations with people, people are like, wow, can I come along? People who I never thought would ever engage in church anymore are like, mm. well, if anyone's going to be a safe place, it's going to be you, yep. um, which is yeah. beautiful and also a huge responsibility. Mm. Um, I think some of the things that I've interrogated, coming back um, I think my internet dropped out. Yeah, it's all right. I think we got the gist of the last bit, a beautiful but a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Um, so coming back to your question about mm. um, what have I interrogated about church and what are the dreams? Mm. Um, I think interrogating, interrogating, do you become a church that... Um, do you become a church that has a statement of beliefs where people come along and they have to subscribe to a set of beliefs um, while also communicating that you do have beliefs as well? Yeah, but, right, yeah. So not communicating a strict framework of belief, but also saying, hey, these are the things that we do believe. Yeah, um, yeah. And so we had a really beautiful conversation at the beginning where we had a little bit of diverse um, diversity in our theological beliefs within our, our board and our eldership that was starting and founding the church where um, we kind of, we didn't start specific, we just started very broad and people can go on to the, the New City Church website, newcitychurch.com.au uh, and read our statement of belief. Oh, I actually don't think it's, it's an affirmation of faith. That's what we, mm. that's where mm. we landed. Um, yeah. And so we, and so I think interrogating belief versus faith and what does that look like? That people don't have to be anywhere, um, but when they come, they'll find this mm. um, and they'll find people searching. Um, I think the space for questions and uh silence and diversity and dialogue uh, and really trying to interrogate how does that work well where you don't destabilize everyone by throwing out all the questions and yeah. being like let's deconstruct everything 
um, and doing that in a way that people feel supported and don't feel like they're crumbling right in front of your eyes. But a lot <laughs> of people are actually in that space. Mm. Um, and, and also church leadership as well. Um, figuring out what does it mean to be a team of pastors rather than a single pastor um, and, and safety and structures that keep people safe and accountable. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> that, that, I think that's really helpful. I think you're right. It's, it's, it's so often a, a balance, right? Because you sometimes people are just looking for that one thing they want to see to make them feel they can come and belong there. Um, and also, as you say, like, you know, to form a community that's going to be vibrant and vital often needs to have some level of a shared vision, a shared value set, a shared belief set. That, that, again, it then becomes how you hold it, how you hold people who are, only opting into part of that and, and or, or still figuring it out themselves. But I think sometimes it is very helpful to have something <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. As, as, yeah. as a starting place. And I think that's, yeah, but it's, it's, it's an interesting way to, to, to move toward it, right? And I think that's one of the nice things about when you are starting a church or planning a church um, is you actually have to ask a lot of these questions from the start. Um, and it often leads to really fruitful conversation and, and interrogation um, and some really interesting things going forward from that. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, and hopefully it'll, hopefully we're on a good thing. I mean, <laughs> we think we are. Uh, we're finding a lot of life in it. Yep. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that is like talking about dreams for the space is mm. that I think each of us who, uh, have started um, have started the church uh, sort of as a, a board of elders and then as a team of pastors uh, and then broader ministry team. Yep. Um, each of us are just finding incredible healing in the space mm. of being affirmed as people who are valued, loved and belong here and for me, particularly as someone who has felt a call to the ministry for so many years and been told the opposite, that, you know, I'm not a leader, I will not lead people towards Christ, you'll be leading them away from Christ, um, to then finally be recognised by a community for the, uh, for the role that I felt that I should have for so long. Um, you know, that's a beautiful healing thing. Um, and just hearing other people's stories of, of finding that space too, of, of finding a space where this is it. This is what I've been praying for for years or searching for for years um, to be able to create that space. And again, I think it's about seeing people come to life as God wants them to come to life. Uh, to come to flourishing together in community um, uh, around the person of Jesus and, and being able to do that in a way that doesn't have any expectations of a journey that you take, that you start here and you land here. But you actually come and you do your seeking and your finding and let's figure out what that looks like for you. Um, and let's figure out how you want to contribute or what it looks like for you um, and the freedom of that. Um, yeah, so I think those are all the things that I, I pray we will be, and I pray we'll be a little beacon in Sydney for people who are on the margins as we speak, who are in those spaces thinking, is there more? Where's that secret community? Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, that's my prayer for New City. Um, yeah. That's, that's beautiful. And as much as I want to go for three hours, what... <laughs> Why not end with a prayer, right? Why not end with that beautiful moment? Steph, I, I, I bless you more life. May the great work begin. Uh, how can people connect with you, with, with, with New City, uh, with e anything you want to shout out now? Here's, here's the spot. People, get your tabs open. Get the thumbs working. Get ready. Um, new City is newcitychurch.com.au. Oh, um, what a URL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, equal Voices, I think, is equalvoices.org.au. Man, I should have done my research before this. Um, People will I figure mean, it out. <laughs> <laughs> people, 
people are welcome to find me on the socials and connect with me. I'm often sharing things publicly. Um, so Steph, look up my bio and my name is there. That's what I'm listed as on Facebook and Twitter, I believe. No, not Twitter, Instagram. Um, Twitter is a 2021 goal, so look out. Hey, come hang out. Um, I also blog a little bit, but very spor sporadically, um, queerevangelical.com. Um, I think those are all the spaces. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, my, my ongoing prayers with you all as you, as you begin and continue, well, not begin, you've begun, but continue. Uh, and uh, yeah, and hopefully we'll get you back on some other time soon. And there's a lot there's more to talk about. And I just thank you for your time. Totally. Thanks so much, Liam. Thanks to everyone for listening as well. It's been a pleasure to have a convo.